This case involves one of the youngest murderers in the state of Indiana. The story of a young man who felt so suffocated by one of his parents and let down by another. So, he did the unthinkable and made a truly disturbing decision. A decision he now claims to deeply regret. Before I start, just a quick 30 seconds to thank today's sponsor, Wicked Clothes, who have been a great help to the channel. They have recently released one of my new favourite designs, which you can now pre-order, The True Crime Club. They also have this serial killer documentary and chill design available in t-shirt and hat now too. And you can also get a dog collar for your little poochies now. So check them out as I'm sure you'll find something you like. It helps to support my work on YouTube and you get some awesome stuff too. If you click the link in the description, you will get 10% off your baskets or you can use Disturbant in the coupon section to get 10% off. And now, onto the video. Greg Oosley was a 14 year old boy from Pearson, Indiana. Greg's upbringing was considered to be normal. His parents Joby and Bonnie took the time to bond with him and at one point the family were close. They would often go hunting and play sports together. Greg also lived with his two older sisters. Neighbours would later look back and speak of how good their parents were to their children. But as good as things were, the family did have their arguments, like any other family, and these were nothing out of the ordinary. That was until the girls grew old enough to move out. Because they moved out, the mother Bonnie felt neglected by her daughters, and this brought her pain. She selfishly never wanted any of her children to leave her side. She now became paranoid that Greg would do the same as his sisters, which of course, he would when the time was right. Her paranoia became overwhelming for Greg, and soon enough, he became her emotional punching bag. Greg often became the victim of unprovoked rages from his mother, where she would attempt to make him feel guilty as he would soon leave her too when he was old enough. His mother's overwhelming behaviour started at around 11 and 12 years of age. As the years went on, the constant verbal attacks began to wear Greg down and he began to resent his mother. Greg also saw his father as useless and someone who struggled to show his feelings. People that knew Joby said that he was a rather reserved person. From the harassment by his mother and being ignored by his father, thoughts began to fester in Greg's mind that were both suicidal and homicidal. Greg had also taken a liking to inhalants. Since the age of just 12, he had developed a serious habit of consuming the fumes from WD-40, paint thinner, gasoline and glue. Greg spoke to his parents about feeling suicidal and homicidal and about the deep anger building inside of him. But they didn't take any of it seriously at all and put it down to Greg watching too many movies. He was worried that this anger would either lead him to kill himself or somebody else. Then one day, when his mother Bonnie was hanging some washing on the line, Greg got his rifle with a scope attached and aimed it at her. He took a deep breath and steadied the rifle, aiming it at her in the crosshair. He then put his finger on the trigger and then put his rifle down. He couldn't go through with it. At the age of just 13, Greg had spoken to some of his friends, confessing that he wanted to take the lives of his parents. He even wrote it in his school workbooks, but nobody tried to stop him. So, on the evening of February 27th, 1993, when Greg was just 14 years old, he grabbed his father's shotgun and loaded it. He then walked into his parents' bedroom while they slept and he stood over them, aimed the gun at his father and pulled the trigger. The gunshot woke up his mother. She panicked and attempted to flee. She managed to get to the dining room phone in a desperate effort to get help. Greg was already quickly behind her and followed her. He fired two shots into the back of her head. After Greg had carried out this chilling crime, he took his dad's truck 
and traveled three miles to his best friend's house. He told this friend exactly what he had done. He then left and began to concoct a plausible story to tell the police. So, at 4am, on that very morning, Greg returned home, packed the truck in the garage and planted the shotgun at the front entrance of the home. He then ran over to his neighbor's house in a pretend frantic state, telling them that he had just gotten home from driving around in the car to discover his parents' bodies in the house. He said that somebody must have broken into the home and killed his parents in a robbery gone wrong. The police soon arrived and immediately they found inconsistencies in his story. Greg quickly became a suspect and right away his friend who he had confided in had confessed and told the police what Greg had done. It would be the very next day when Greg confessed to shooting both of his parents and he also gave a motive. He said that he and his parents argued on a regular basis. They argued about chores, the length of his hair and when he could go to his friend's house. He told the officer, I have been thinking about killing them every time I got mad. They just don't seem to understand me. Due to how cold and brutal the crime was and because there was no evidence of provocation or self-defense, and because there was clear evidence of premeditation, the prosecution team strongly suggested that he be tried as an adult. At the time, Indiana law didn't permit juveniles to waive their Miranda rights without first getting parental approval. But what was to happen if the juvenile had no parents or legal guardians? Well, the police were aware of the law, but they simply chose to ignore it. The trial of Greg is still controversial to this day. Only two days after the confession and less than three days after the crime was committed, Greg was given a 20 minute hearing and in those 20 minutes, the courts decided to trial him as an adult. Greg first pleaded not guilty to the murders while his defense attorney was granted two court appointed psychiatrists to review his mental state. They were going to determine whether Greg was competent enough to stand trial. Greg then changed his plea deal and pleaded guilty but mentally ill under the recommendation of his lawyer. He received two consecutive sentences of 30 years for each of the murders with no chance of parole until 2019. He was only 15 years old in 1994 when he began his sentence and became one of the youngest convicted felons in the state's history. Following the sentencing phase, Greg wrote a letter which read, My name is Greg. I am 15 years old and sitting in the county jail. 10 months ago, on February the 27th, 1993, I committed a terrible crime. I murdered my parents. I'm definitely not proud. In fact, I can't stand that fact that it's my fault they are gone. Reasons for it are hard to find. The biggest reason is I had a lot of problems and I didn't get the help I needed for them. A week before it happened, I told my mum I was suicidal and had gotten bad thoughts. She told me I was watching too many movies. So I gave up and figured I was messed up and I always will be. Now look where I am at. In here, I've been getting the help I need from God. A lot of people from the outside probably don't believe me because they can't see it for themselves, but it's true. The best help you can get is from God. God will be your best friend and will never leave you. Because of God, I've made it this far and I plan to live a good long life. So if you think you have a problem, don't overlook it. Tell someone about it. Tell your parents or counselors or teachers. Please tell someone that will listen to you. If the first person doesn't listen to you, don't give up. Try another person. It's your life and it's very, very important. Throughout his time in prison, Greg achieved a liberal arts degree and reflected upon his crime. He deeply regretted taking the lives of his parents. Whilst in prison, he also wrote a 40 page essay that was released to the public about how and why he killed his parents. 
He also wrote and received letters from his sisters and their children, and an aunt and uncle who had forgiven him for what he had done. The courts denied his parole a couple of times, but in 2020, they released Greg on parole. He is considered to be a poster child for people who can turn their lives around in prison. Greg only served 24 years of a 60 year sentence. He left prison aged 39 and now lives in Indiana. While in prison, his goal was to work with troubled youth. It will be interesting to see if he is able to achieve this goal, or if something far sinister will come from his release.